our panel debate and um, we're going to be talking a bit more about capacity strengthening as we were hearing about uh, earlier in, in the morning, well the morning here, earlier in the day wherever you are. Um, and we're going to be talking about the opportunities in the interaction between digitalization and localization in a framework of capacity strengthening in humanitarian logistics. So the COVID pandemic has highlighted how quickly we can all adapt to all things digital, but what can digitalization do for capacity strengthening and localization? So I'm joined by three speakers and experts in the field um, from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. We are pleased to have Chokan Jang, who's Regional Logistics Manager at IFRC. From Lyon in France, we have Guillaume Noilly, who's the Learning and Development Coordinator at BioForce. Uh, Guillaume ensures the quality of training modules in supply security and safety. And from Durban in South Africa, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Vani Naidu, who's Professor at the School of Management, Information Technology and Governance at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Dr. Naidu will be sharing her insights into the digital transformation of university teaching during the pandemic. So uh, thank you all. Welcome to all of you from uh, a good selection around the world. Um, and I just wanted to refer to Athalie Mayo's cake analogy yesterday um, and the fact that all of us taking part in this conference are metaphorically um, being allowed to sample and savour some delicious cake. Well, my challenge to you panellists or an opportunity is to bake a cake. Um, and you're going to have to choose the ingredients of the perfect cake that will strengthen local capacity. And I can tell you that digitalization is already in the cake mixture. So, I'm going to start with you, Chokun, um, and ask you from a localization expert viewpoint, what ingredients do you think you need? Um, actually, there are several ingredients that uh, we would need uh, to bake a cake for localization. For a start, there should be a shared understanding of what localization is. Localization covers the aspect of food partners where we are doing or running things. Uh, and operations or programs in a localized manner with localized resources as much as possible. Um, so in the, in the supply chain aspect, uh, we could be looking at different priorities uh, of setting an avenue for logistics preparedness, uh, which will give us the most impact and uh, efficiencies in response. For example, one of the focus supply chain um, or the people who are actually looking at during operations, people will look at delivery of relief items. I mean, reaching people at faster at a minimum course. So how localization and um, preparedness will go hands in hand here is that uh, we will look at stock contingency preparedness, for example, and developing a uh, local standard um, uh, um, identifying the resources of uh, or setting up a long-term framework agreement with our suppliers in order for us to be able to reach the communities in the fastest time and at the minimum cost. So all this needs to be done uh, during the peace time. So I would say that that's the ingredients that we're, we're actually looking at to push it together. Lovely. Okay, so sort of preparing in advance, really, um, yeah. for for uh, difficulties ahead. Um, so um, I'm going to put pose a similar question to you as well, um, Guillaume Noilly. Uh, the the question to you would be: you you look after training. So what ingredients would create the perfect training cake? Thank you, Anya. Hello to uh, my colleagues, panelists. Um, yeah, so in my cake, if you do a, a nice uh, bakery or a nice cake, I would, I would put the basics uh, at first, which are flour, eggs, and sugar. 
And for me, that would be like the learning objectives, the main key messages, uh, the core content of the training, what we want the people to learn. But delivered uh, as it is, uh, raw, that would be very difficult to swallow, that would be dry, and I guess that would be difficult to digest. But this is not enough, it's not satisfactory, not pleasant. Uh, therefore, we could we have learned how to add some fruits, some chocolate, this cake, in especially in face-to-face -face trainings, where we have we give the opportunity to the trainees to leave their working environment and to focus on learning and to share their experience, to network, and so on. So this is fine face-to-face, uh, -face, and it's also feasible uh, digitally or let's say at distance, uh, but. If we think about it, what really makes a cake uh, tasty and digestible is how the chemistry works uh, between the ingredients. And therefore, for us, I mean, uh, according to me, you need to add in your cake like peer-to-peer -peer work between trainees, exchanges with the facilitator, answers to their questions. You need to apply the learning you just got and get feedback from it so that you maybe translate it to sustainable competencies, and you and the trainer need to adapt the learning to monitor and adjust. So to me, these elements would be the role of the baking powder and the whisk. For my French colleagues who doesn't know what's a whisk, it's the <laughs> bakers know. So um, so face to face, we know how to do it. We know how to bake it. Uh, there is training of trainers. There are excellent trainers in the sector. Uh, there, there are some in the in the audience, by the way, here. Uh, but remotely, last year we got on the last year we, we got the confirmation that it's feasible, uh, but it requires more than dry, digitalized self-learning activities. So for a satisfactory cake, I suggest a mixture of asynchronous activities, which are like the self-learning activities, the thing you do on your own, and synchronous, which are peer work, exchanges with facilitator, feedback, and so on. And that could be done as well uh, with blended learning solutions. Uh, blended learning is like mixing distance and face-to-face. -face. And to us, and maybe in the future, it will be the most appropriate compromise. So as a conclusion, the recipe for face-to-face -face and distance learning are different, but follow the same principle, such as the chemistry for uh, with the ingredients of a cake. And with the adult learning principles, uh, you, you would uh, make your cake uh, tasty. Lovely. So, um, That's a very delicious cake. <laughs> <laughs> I was, apart from the whisk, I thought you were perhaps going to show me a cake that you had actually baked earlier, but uh, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, and let's go on now to uh, Vani Naidu. Um, so you've been rolling out e-learning uh, at universities in uh, South Africa and of course, uh, Guillaume talked about uh, digital cakes not being too dry. Um, so what ingredients have you used to bake your perfect e-learning cake? Thank you, Anya, uh, and hello to the audience. Well, uh, there's so much stories about these tasty cakes here. I'm going to hope for a healthy but tasty cake, all right? So uh, yesterday, the keynote speaker, the professor raised the very uh, uh, an important idea of the fourth industrial revolution. Now the fourth industrial revolution basically moved everyone towards more uh, digital transformation, not digital, but more technologically using technological tools, be it within the organization, whatever, even if it is an organization such as a learning institution like where I come from, which is a university. So basically what occurred was we already had uh, some of the initial ingredients, but the adds on to make it healthy because the COVID-19, as you know, last year, uh, brought with it one of the greatest humanitarian crises to face a humankind in our history. And it affected all uh, society, sectors in society, education included. So to flatten the curve or prevent the spread of the virus, we as educationists, be it academics or trainers, et cetera, to adjust to the new normal and move to a more digitalized virtual classroom. This was done, however, at a very accelerated pace, meaning there was going to be lots of challenges. However, some essential ingredients from our very healthy cake here 
would be, um, I would say the first important thing would be that staff and my students needed essential basic training to embrace the new e-learning platform, to embrace the new pedagogy, pedagogy of teaching and learning online, to embrace the new, uh, for example, using Zoom or Microsoft uh, team, et cetera. Uh, from there, I would look at infrastructure for sustainable handling of e-learning at universities in Africa or wherever in the world. Uh, then we look at proper skills and technical support. You can have a brilliant system. However, if you don't have the necessary uh, support structures in place to actually enhance it and assist the staff and the students along the way. Uh, so you need them as well. So another important thing is the funding aspect. And here, as you know, South Africa is quite hard hit by the pandemic. So when it came to money and uh, most of our money went towards healthcare, and keeping our borders safe and our community safe. So we had to look at external funding as a means to support our on learning, uh, 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 online learning. Another important aspect of my ingredient would be changing attitude. That's very important since many people view this new type of online virtual engagement as something new. It disturbs their mindset because it's new. 20 2020, it was new. 2021, there was an adjustment. The uh, students and staff understood the importance of going online with the present situation and the pandemic. So it was embraced better. And in 2021, it's, it was basically more smooth e-learning. The last issue, which I thought was very important is the stakeholder engagement issue. Uh, for example, one of our stakeholders are disabled learners. And uh, many of these learners found the e-learning platforms quite uh, challenging and they encountered problems which led them to become frustrated learners. So I say developers should take into account the disabled learners as well when designing online uh, learning platforms. All in all, uh, there is no one fixed best way. Well, like, like we heard from the last two speakers now, baking a cake is different for all of us, however, the important thing is that in this current uh, crisis, we need to respond in a way which we use the digital or virtual platforms to reach either our trainer, our training staff or learning. Thank you. That, that's really interesting. And you mentioned the needs of the uh, disabled students there, and that had to be taken into consideration. So, so one of the uh, questions that has already come into Mentimeter, and by the way, um, do start sending your questions in. And also, um, if you want to contribute to this discussion, just raise your hand and, and I'll call you in into the chat. Um, one of the comments on Mentimeter are, um, are basic ingredients of the cake based on for training preparation based on needs assessment so that that's one for you Guillaume would, would, would how how do you actually take into consideration what people need Guillaume are you are you there you you lost your sound okay um I can come in if you want, Anya. Yes, okay. Okay, it's fine. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, Anya. Yes, the, the question is, uh, it's coming on Mentimeter, and it is, who is, um, are basic ingredients of the cake based for training, preparation, based on needs assessments? Yes, that's the that the start of the, of the recipe, actually, to know what are the needs, and that's one of the most difficult things. Um, to design like a training. Most of the time we start from a competency framework where we see the skills that are needed to get to a, an objective. And we would then compare with an assessment of the existing, skin, existing skills of the person or in an organization or in the sector. So doing this comparison on a fixed base that would allow to to do the to do the recipe according to the need. Okay, and Vani, were you going to add anything there? Uh, actually, I was going to add that uh, we need to look at um, uh, baking the cake in a more holistic manner, so to speak. One of the most important assets within any organization, if we look at the global cluster, for example, staff, 
in terms of their training is that they need capacity building so that they can uh, be the best or improve their efficiencies, productivity, et cetera. We want smooth running. So if you take care of the human assets and properly promote them in terms of capacity building, I say this won't just be a tasty cake. This will be a cake that's really enjoyed by all the staff as well as the leadership as well. So it's a two-way thing there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we don't have to talk about baking for the whole discussion. That was just a way of opening it and just to add a flavor to, to our um, discussion. And I just wanted to ask a few more questions now, um, really about uh, capacity strengthening and localization and, and look at that, uh, that theme now. And then turn to, uh, to Chok and Jang. Um, so you're on the ground there. Uh, you're a localization expert to, to, to some extent. Uh, how close do you think um, organizations uh, where you are, are, cl are close to meeting that expectations that uh, first responders will one day be local and that international responders will actually end up being uh, the exception and not the rule? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we always heard about this uh, response to be as local as possible and as uh, international as necessary. So I, I think um, that this, this has been some things that everyone talked about as well. But um, how close are we to it? I mean, under the grand bargain plans, uh, the idea is to have 25% of the fund channel directly to the local or national actors by 2020. But we know that uh, by 2019, which is like two years back, uh, there's only 2% percent has been directed to them. There is a slow start here, but I, I think one of the positive things that uh, came out of it is that we're seeing a positive uh, momentum that people are starting to pay more attention uh, to localization. There's greater commitments shown among the stakeholders like the UN, international humanitarian organizations, government and private sectors. So looking at the COVID-19, uh, willing or unwilling that it's push us really to that direction that uh, we have to rely a lot more on local people and local actors to, 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 to actually work on an operation and to support this. Um, closure of borders, restriction of travels, we are unable to provide our normal support. This is what, uh, what we have all been experienced for the past one and a half years. And I think the situations haven't really changed a lot as, in, uh, as of today. So, um, so this is actually increasingly our local partners have been taking lead under such circumstances. I, I think that 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 is that is such a momentum that we 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 are looking at as well. Uh, yeah. So yeah, maybe just giving you for example that during the COVID operations that uh, IFRC has under uh, undertake a law, uh, procurement for 15.7 million to rent of procurement. And 70% out of it, 74% actually out of it is actually a local procurement undertaken by our local partners and our local country offices. And that speaks a lot on how much that it has come a long way since we started off with, with, with building the capacities and localizations and putting our procurement procedure in place with, with our partners. So the, this actually shows a lot that uh, it is actually getting there. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that uh, we are not progressing or things like that. And, and, and there is a momentum for all the stakeholders, I think around the table here to, to see that this is, this is something that we want to, to make it happen and we want to make it a success, yeah. So, yeah. so that's very in, encouraging that, that you've been able to do that. What difference has it made and what challenges have you faced as a result? Uh, of course, we make a lot of differences uh, of, uh, that uh, we saving um, uh, um, we saving like um, a lot of transport costs. Uh, that's been cost saving, and then uh, we also in procedures wise that uh, we work together with the partner to see how we can align it with the local context and and. We see that how we can simplify some procedures, but uh, this is this is all a, a a whole 
lesson learned kind of thing that we will we actually possibly need to take it into account and for our future operations and how we want to manage it and what actually works and what doesn't work. I, I think that that's pretty much what 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 actually give us the takeaway here. Okay, thank you, Chakun, for the moment. I can see uh, that Oliver Oswald has raised his hand. Um, do you want to come in? Can you switch your microphone on? No, it worked. Hello, yeah. together. <laughs> That's a Welcome. really brilliant discussion. Thanks for, for letting me in for a question. Um, I've been enrolled in some of the trainings on the, on the global cluster level and uh, especially the logistics sponsoring training also recently now the e-learning training and uh, one big element for me also from the operational side uh, one of the benefits from these trainings is exchange amongst the partners you know networking and also well <clears throat> in the end I think training kind of leads greatly into step standardization of our work processes and speeds up uh, all the uh, operations. So for me, the question right now on that panel is how right now, how can we actually achieve the standardization and keep that exchange and kind of networking community approach together to uh, continue our exchange and also to grow as a community? How can we actually step cover these gaps now? Who would like to, to pick that up, Guillaume or Chokun? Um, Guillaume. He's waiting for his sound. I don't know. Is your mic, is your mic on? <laughs> Actually, I can't activate it myself, so I had to wait. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Oliver, for, for the, the comment and the question. Uh, I would say that there is a, I know that there is a, um, a community of practice which has been created, uh, like uh, it's the actors of capacity building who meet together and who have uh, done a workshop, uh, I think last month on the learnings of this period. And they have come with, uh, they have come with like findings, common findings and the, the way the traps of digitalized uh, all, all to balance like the level of digitalization and but all agreed um, from what I know that this is a so this is an accelerator for realizing the, 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 the capacity of uh, distance learning uh, which was already existent but uh, just an accelerator uh, acceleration of innovation as well of the tools and and people buy it uh, even if they are tired of the computer so I think for the futures there, there has to find the balance to keep uh, motivation on, on, on side, uh, improve access, improve uh, uh, quality as well, because quality shouldn't be a sacrifice. Uh, um, yeah, in that regard. Hope I answer your question. Okay, thank you. And we'll just, I'll just take one more question and then I've got um, some more myself that I would like to ask. And uh, Danielle uh, German, uh, would welcome. Would you like to ask your question or make a comment? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, I, I had put it in the Menti, but about training of trainers, particularly. And one thing around, you know, how we can be assessing those kinds of soft skills that is also assessed as part of training of trainers remotely um, and how they're and how people would interact with trainees and so some of those kinds of things and also connected to that is then I think a lot of times in training of trainers is also kind of self-reflection and assessment around biases and perceptions and I think that especially if we're talking about capacity building of local actors my question is is there any kind of lessons that have been learned around how we can you know challenge perceptions of national actors who might be operating in a conflict, which is also impacting their lives. And so some of those added complexities um, of, you know, operating as a local actor within the context that you're, you know, yourself and your family are living in. Well, I think that's quite a difficult one. Guillaume, can you answer that? And, and Vanny, perhaps you could perhaps translate that to your university uh, ecosystem um, and, and look at the training of trainers. I can, I can take that. Uh, okay, you've raised quite valid points. Um, just like uh, trainers, as well as they're impacted by the 
overall pandemic, taking care of their families or thinking about a loved one who's sick or whatever, this also impacts on the, or we call it in academia, your well-being. And um, it, it is something to take uh, into account in the training session. You're going to get all types of learners on a virtual platform, okay? Each one of them has their own unique style, their own perception, and how they take in the training. However, you as a trainer need to always keep it lively, keep it engaged, and keep it, how shall we say, let the trainees explore they would come up with this. For example, one important thing, I was uh, doing a presentation on um, academic well-being during COVID-19. And one of the questions is, you know, I feel so bad. This was in Kingdom University in Bahrain. He said to me, I feel so bad, Vani, because I feel that my uh, uh, learners are not always engaged. They're so quiet over there. So I said, you know what? There's some digital tools out there. You can use a random selector. And sometimes I do this in class. I see something out of the box, completely crazy. And then everybody wakes up. So you as a trainer uh, have to uh, uh, use your soft skills in a very unique, inventive and creative way to get across to the audience. Virtual training has brought on challenges. However, as today is uh, a very important day in the lives of South Africans, I'm going to tell you something. It's our Freedom Day today. And uh, the words of uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, the father for nation was this. He said, don't uh, judge me by my success. He says, you would rather judge me by how many times that I've fallen and got up. So since this is a scenario where online or the e-training e is a new perspective for trainers as well as for the trainees, uh, there's going to be lots of gaps. There's going to be uh, uh, issues coming up all the time. But the idea is to learn from it, to go forward, and to continue with the engagement, to continue exploring the interaction. That is important for us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, Peter, you've put in in uh, in Menti uh, and uh, do do put your camera on and come in here because you 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 come back with a question about do we really understand the needs? Uh, do we understand what localization really means? Um, and you said you were happy to elaborate. So yeah, yes, please. Yes. Hello, I'm Peter uh, from working with Medair at the moment. Um, I worked also a lot with Tierfund and we do a lot in the fields of uh, especially localization and capacity building. And there are really specific dynamics, I think, that are coming into that uh, space. It, it dovetails a bit on also what Mike was saying yesterday. Uh, local partners, local people involved with, for example, humanitarian responses have very specific mandates. Um, and they, um, and they, they might also, also have very specific needs. So my point is I'm not arguing anything of digital platforms or anything else, but in the light of for example, uh, responding to needs and, and responses, do we really understand what we need in order to mobilize the local, uh, the local uh, logistics capacities, either maybe in the commercial sector or maybe in the, um, in the humanitarian sector or maybe within the governmental bodies? And um, so that's the question. And to give a very practical example to that, so for example, if a disaster happens in a country, do we understand whether the problem, if we have to set up, for example, um, uh, a response at the airfield or because there are uh, capacity constraints, do we really know whether they have the capacity there? Because that is, in the end, critical for successful responses. So this is more maybe a bit, a bit of a different look. So I, I understand general capacity building, e-learning platforms. I'm not arguing any of it. But in the light of being effective in responses and helping people as large community, do we understand where we need to start? working on things because capacity building is also a long-term process it's it, it is not done overnight and if you want to be ready in a year's time you need to set priorities so therefore i come back to my question do we really understand the needs and that might differ over the countries or continents but yeah enough i talk a lot sorry no that's a good that's a very good question and of course we heard in the last uh, presentation that uh, it is capacity building of course takes years um, so I, I think I'd like to bring in Chokun there because, you know, what would be the needs on the ground there for capacity building? And do you think um, training modules, any training would really take that into consideration? 
yes, in some part, yes. The training modules will, will take that into consideration. And what his, um, Peter was saying was that, do we really know what is actually the need at, at, at the ground? I mean, to be honest, that uh, if you ask me, that, that probably most of the time that people will, will not be able to know that what could actually the, the need but I think that this, this is what I want to reiterate again in terms of logistics partners as well. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's building capacity buildings and in some part of the trainings, we, we do, we do, we do uh, 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 train people on how to assess the needs and, and what you need to take into consideration what you are when, when you're on the ground. But there are also in some instances that I, I think that it's not only about training as well. I mean, you need to bring people down to the field and, and people need to work together on the job and know that what they actually need to see. It's, it's, it's not about, uh, yeah, I mean, training will, will, will be a big part of it. I, I mean, that we, we built, yeah. But that is also uh, something that we, we need to, to, to work together with the local partners. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of uh, getting to know that what needs to be considered. And that's also with the logistics partners as well. Uh, I mean, I, I know that uh, people are doing a lot of logistic assessment and, it's, it's, uh, and, and to see that uh, uh, what needs to be taken care of uh, in terms of not only on software, but also on hardware as well. You need to be prepared on uh, what kind of warehousing that you, you need to put into the place and then what kind of pre-positioning stuff. So it's not only about training, but it's also about uh, being able to support both the hardware and the software part of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I know that there, there's a couple of you with your hands up. I'll bring you in in a minute, but I just wanted to go back to Guillaume because your organization, Be Your Force, has uh, conducted a study of uh, many professionals. And I think that is aligned to some of this question, isn't it? And you've prepared a, a presentation, but I'd prefer it if you just whiz through it because we, you know, it's quite long. So perhaps use it as, a, as an aid, but uh, you know, if you can just tell us the main points, that would be very helpful. And uh, very fine with me. So uh, to, 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 to build on, uh, on what uh, my predecessor was just saying, Indeed, I think preparedness and the, 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 also the, the presentation we had before, like how to assess the needs, uh, the skills needed uh, in order to be prepared for the crisis is very important. And so this leads to the assessment of, of, of gaps in skills. And one of the objectives to avoid duplication and to be effective because you can't uh, answer to every specific uh, need of every individual. So you need to find uh, common ground. So yeah, in that uh, regard, uh, but I won't use the PowerPoint then. Uh, thank you for that, it's, it's nice. You could, uh, you could perhaps just give us some of the uh, main sure. findings, which would be very so, helpful. So actually uh, the study of humanitarian profession that was carried out uh, last year uh, on, and uh, presented in a, in a forum um, end of last year, uh, which gathered many organizations, many people, and so on, and which tried to uh, check what are the, the, what can we improve in professionaliz professionalization of the sector. So out of 24 professions that were studied, one was uh, logistics, naturally. And on logistics, we noticed that um, there is a large circulation of of uh, professionals between uh, private sector, commercial and development and uh, emergency humanitarian action. There's a large circulation, uh, but there is, uh, whereas in the private sector, we have like accreditation that are well known and well recognized. In the humanitarian sector, we have very few. Uh, so the, the best known is the CILT, CILT and Fritz Institute uh, certification, uh, but in comparison with the private sector, there is a very little buy-in. I mean, there is a relatively uh, modest buy-in. So there is a lack of mutually agreed certification, qualification for humanitarian logisticians. And that's one of the weakness of uh, the logistic profession, whereas uh, it's maybe one of the most professionalized uh, already. Um, yeah. So 
the need for accreditation, the need for uh, recognition of the skills, I think uh, that, that would uh, pave the way to e efficient uh, capacity building solutions. And at different levels, naturally, at field level, management, coordination, country, strategic, tactical level. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very complex at the end, but uh, it, there is a need for investment in, in this, according to, uh, to the studies and the respondent to it. Okay, thank you. So um, just to say that if you want to know more about the findings of the study, I think we can put a link to it in the chat and you can have a look uh, now or later on. That That's really interesting. So you're, you're talking about a professionalizing logisticians or are you talking about professionalizing humanitarian logisticians? Which, 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 which do you mean? Yeah, actually, that's the question. Uh, shall we uh, transform like private uh, logisticians that, they, that have got their skills elsewhere than the humanitarian sector, in the private sector, for example, should we transform them into humanitarian, giving them uh, the core humanitarian skills, which are not necessarily logistics, but maybe a little bit logistics related to, or should we uh, build a real solid uh, competency framework and the certification, the trainings and so on that comes with it for logisticians that have not necessarily experienced uh, elsewhere before. So that's a quite open question. And, uh, we could perhaps do that. I, I think we may actually be able to do a, a, a Zoom poll. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, perhaps we could just uh, see what the audience think about that. Um, yeah, that would be nice. The second one, by the way. Yep. Can we can we put that up on the screen with the get people to to vote or? Yep. No, it's not this one. All right, the but, second one. Yeah. But still, it could be interesting if you. Okay, so you you're here. We go. <laughs> Sorry. One person. Does everyone want to uh, vote now? You are a humanitarian logistician. You get to a party. You meet this person, not from the sector. They ask you, "What's your job?" Would you rather answer, "I'm a logistician," or "I'm a humanitarian"? Uh, do do uh, do take part in that poll. Because only I think one person has so far. I think it disappeared. Ah, oh, yeah, it's here. So yeah, I mean, we all have been introducing ourselves to people out of the sector. So would you say always proudly, I'm a logistician or I'm a humanitarian first? I think there I... should have been a third option, Anya. What's that? What would your third option be? Um, both. Oh, yes, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Maybe, yeah. maybe people can vote for both. <laughs> okay, I don't know if we'll see the results. Uh, well, you can't vote for both. The system only allows you to take Yeah, okay. but the question was, what, what would you say first? Saying that if you say you're a logistician, then maybe you recognize yourself in a larger world of the logistician in every sector, where, whereas when you say I'm humanitarian, you recognize being in the humanitarian jobs and uh, Anya, uh, yes just to uh, add something here basically you, you are in logistics however humanitarian logistics is more specialized and different compared to the other logistics so basically i think uh, you know uh, my third option humanitarian logistics makes it more how shall we say a better fit Okay, well, thank Actually. you for that. And anyway, most people uh, voted, said they were humanitarians before logisticians. Okay, there have been some very, more people raising their hands, but I'm going to bring in Victor Manan there. Victor, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, do put your camera on and join the conversation. Did you have a comment or a question? Uh, well, I do have a, a bit of both, maybe a comment and a question at the same time. Uh, my name is Victor, I work for Norwegian Red Cross in the Middle East region. And uh, two things, one is contextual learning. So we have a variety of courses that address issues in logistics. And uh, you can do as many certifications as possible, but um, if you look at the nature of responses and the countries in which most logistics actors operate in, they're not really normal systems. You know, you, you, For instance, Syria, it's very restrictive. Um, the currency can move from a dollar to uh, uh, let's say 3,000 in the black market. And after one week, it's $1 to 4,200. 
And uh, when you look at the training programs, they don't prepare you for that. So to what extent do training programs look at the context in which people are operating? Do we borrow from the commercial sector? Do we look at how resilient the structures are and how they're able to adapt quickly? And then do we try to come up with a mix that will allow for a much better, uh, uh, so to say, uh, logistics capacity to be able to deal with the emerging issues? And the second thing is people have different learning preferences. And this is based on their cognitive ability. Uh, someone would prefer to get um, a book that probably addresses issues. Someone else would prefer uh, a live simulation because they find that to be much more interactive. And someone else will prefer to do an, an e-learning course. So our efforts made to find out, first of all, uh, based on the people you're targeting to train, what are their preferences and, 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 and also to identify their cognitive abilities. Because again, in logistics, we have a variety of uh, people who are skilled uh, from people with PhDs to even um, people as basic as drivers who do tracking across the border. So I just wanted to bring this to the floor and just to get feedback and to see what is the community doing about these two issues. Okay, and, and that's it from my side. Thank you, thank you. Before I get the panelists to answer that, let's bring in uh, Susan Hodgson. Um, would you like to ask your question or make a comment and then we can talk yeah. about what you've raised? It's, it's actually similar vein to Victor and, and my comments, I've got a few points to raise, but it's very similar to Victor. I said, made notes the same is, I think we have to talk about what we mean by training. We lump it all together and actually I disagree with the term training because I think it encapsulates so much. We talk about capacity building. Actually, I would argue that in some cases that's capacity strengthening. We shouldn't assume we have to build capacity. They already have capacity. Um, and sometimes that capacity is about what does that organization want? What does that donor need? And I think we have to be clear on our terms. Linked to um, Victor's point, I had the same you know, it can be mentoring, coaching, job swap, on the job experience, informal training, formal training. I think rather than banding the word training around, I think we need to be clear about what we're actually talking about. And my last key point on this is, um, how, here's a novel idea to everybody. Why don't we ask the partner what they want <laughs> instead of making assumptions about what they want? And I would say that's a driver for what we're looking at is what do our partners want us to do? What is it the partner wants from us to help them strengthen what they already have? And then a little bit of a plug for something um, because it hasn't been mentioned. Don't forget, we do have the Universal Logistics Standards coming out, which will be launched on this, this um, month's long sessions. And we also have the Parcel Project. And the idea is, is that we don't tell them what to do and say, here's our systems, why don't you use them? Those the systems are there to help partners develop their own structures based on their own criterias uh, and to develop, um, develop capacity in that sense. So I just want to throw a few things out there, but very much linked to Victor's point about, let's not all assume it's just training when actually, I don't really think we talk about what do we mean by training. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, so I just before coming to you, Guillaume, I think uh, Vanny, in your in when you were devising your programs, your e-learning, you did engage with stakeholders, didn't you? Yes. Or was it afterwards? No, we had to engage with our stakeholders because we have we basically have an obligation to meet their needs. It's not about us. We although we are uh, the facilitators, you know. Uh, you still have to engage with your stakeholders and get a feel of uh, what they need. Are we going to structure our, how shall we say, for example, in a logistics cl a cluster, I do agree with what's being said thus far. It's not about you only. That is why we have uh, the training audits, the development audits, etc., to actually uh, get a feel of the strengths and opportunities out there for further development, for further capacity building. You need to uh, recognize from your partner what do they need and then highlight specifics uh, and take it forward. However, they also need to be very open-minded about this. They can jot down 20 things, but the most important thing, for example, uh, everybody said like uh, when COVID-19 came here last year, 
South Africa decided we are operating on disaster management protocols. It made sense to us. That is why we all got our, excuse the language, shit together very quickly, whether it's education, whether it is uh, schooling, whether it is policing, whatever, because we had a duty and obligation and this was a different paradigm shift. So this is our, sometimes you gotta think out of the box guys, you know? to adapt to the necessary environment out there, to, to adapt to what's needed as well out there. So Guillaume, how do you make the training relevant to a particular situation? Yeah, uh, about contextual learning, I agree. There is a uh, there is need naturally uh, to, to build, to, or to strengthen capacity on uh, in advance if possible. Uh, the fact that, I mean, you might logistician, logistics is, is uh, different defined by its uh, need for agility uh, because the demand is changing quickly and the context change a lot. So uh, I wouldn't say inflation, for example, is a new, is a new thing in the, in the sector or for the sector. It has always been in the in big crisis. So for me, uh, like uh, subjects such as storage, uh, inventory management, procurement are already incorporating this, can, this challenge, for example. Uh, but still, uh, I agree with you, there is a space for field training, very contextualized, but we should be careful to not mix between what we call a briefing and what we call a training. The training to me should be applicable in different contexts or at least in different regions in the same uh, area. Um, to answer to the question of Victor about uh, adult learning, I would say, yes, we think that people, some people like to read books, some others like uh, active uh, sessions and so on. It seems like whatever the cultural uh, context, uh, the adult learning principles are valid almost everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And uh, I think but the cultural identity of the trainers makes a lot and the cultural awareness. So I think one of the challenge and the thing to reach is to have more local trainers and that's something that happened by accident, I would say, also during the COVID because tr trainers couldn't travel. So strengthen the capacity of the local trainers rather than make people travel. And uh, to finish on the, on the question of Suzanne on, the, on how to collect uh, the requests from the field, that's a, big, that's a big thing. For now and for, from what concerns us, it goes through the HQ of the organization, like the logistic director that we call and try to see what's what's new. Uh, so uh, there are, I think, progresses to do in collection of the needs directly from the fields and the practitioners to avoid like the missing, the, the lack of information going through headquarters and field in organizations. And okay. last thing, certification. I think yeah. we, uh, for certification, for being certified as a trainee, trainers or training providers, we need to uh, include the, the public, the targets, the, the NGOs. So uh, we have to do it and to be certified, we, we need to do it. So it's, it's already in the process. So yes, uh, certification and of course standards, uh, what makes a particular professional? How do you decide those professional standards? Lots of, lots of questions there. Um, some more people with their hands raised. So I think uh, Tom Olson, you've got your hand raised. Please put your camera on if you like. And uh, I think, uh, did Theo Lingen, did you have your um, hand raised at one point? Do join in at this point. Um, Tom, what? Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, the, my colleagues have raised uh, a lot of good points, but I think also is start the whole thing with preparedness. Uh, and if we then have identified where, where the short comes up, when the, where the shortcomings are. If you're looking at more South Sudan, you talked about South Sudan, looking at Syria, you're talking also about a whole generation and more who, who has no formal training or education or dropped out. So how can we, go, when we start doing the response or the preparedness and response, are we good enough, all of us, to really looking at the development part as a part of the emergency? And there, I think, maybe where we start looking at our own needs, how to do capacity, vocational training, I don't say it's the only one, but per perhaps vocational training can also help local actors 
in, in their strive towards being more independent and not always relying on, on foreign assistance. Um, so I will actually ask and, and question, are we able or are we good enough to plan together as a humanitarian entity and not only looking at UNICEF and not only looking at individual organizations, but how well are we able to plan together uh, in on how we're going to respond and how and have we been able to identify the, the humanitarian or the human needs as well in terms of human resources? So, so that's do you my mean, question. Do you mean as the cluster that we... Uh, Both as a cluster, but we are all partners of the cluster. Yeah. I mean, the cluster has a lead, but I think we all need to contribute more to the cluster and recognize the, the importance of the cluster. Thank you. Um, before, I won't uh, let the panelists try and answer that yet because there's some more questions. Theo, um, do you want to come in and make your point? Yes. Hello to everybody. Good, uh, good afternoon uh, from Germany. Yes, my, my comment, it's not a question. My comment on this is um, we have seen uh, the, on your vote, uh, Jim, about humanitarian or logisticians. No, we are all together humanitarian logisticians. It's, therefore, we are here. That's one point. And we need, and this is, uh, from my point of view, uh, the challenge. Uh, we need all, even as a humanitarian logistics officer, uh, the support of the commercial logistics. Uh, commercial logistics is our backbone and our relation to, to transport anything. Therefore, and this will be the challenge for the future, and this is my comment, it will be the challenge for the future to bring together the uh, commercial logistics uh, train stuff together with the humanitarian stuff and not uh, and train them the, the special specialities of the humanitarian logistics. Not about uh, discussing about uh, soft skills. It's about hard skills. What is the difference between humanitarian logistics and the commercial logistics, and how we we put these together? That is, from my point of view, the challenge for the future, for the next couple of months, years, even with the opportunity on on working on the uh, e-learning based. Uh, uh, transfer of knowledge, but as well how we can utilize them also for the practical thing, what is necessary on the spot. That's my comment thank, on this. Thank you. Uh, Chok and Jung, do you want to come in on that? I mean, do, do you have, you have quite a lot of uh, work with the, the private sector there, uh, you know, and, and commercial logisticians. Okay. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, I, I do. Actually, I, I would totally agree with Theo what he was saying because I came in as, uh, from a commerce of Texas before I joined the humanitarian sectors. To me, that when I'm doing the take that, I was actually doing that I'm a logistician because to me, a logistician uh, on the commerce of Texas sectors or on the humanitarian sectors, it's um. It doesn't, I mean, technically, it doesn't have a lot of uh, differences. I mean, we're doing the same things. We, we are going through custom clearance, we're doing through international shipping, we're doing through all localized, uh, local transportation distribution. It, it, it's the same thing to me. So why do we want to distinguish between a humanitarian logistician and a commercial logistician? Probably one of the things that uh, make the difference is that uh, um, the adaptations, uh, because we have limited resources as a humanitarian logistician uh, with limited funding as opposed to a commercial logistic. But the way how you solve your problems, the way how you move your goods and the way how you arrange your, your, your stock and inventory management, it, it, it's the same. And then I, I think it, it, we should be able to align uh, somehow with both the humanitarian and commercial logistics to, to make it uh, uh, for, for us to, to have a better response. Uh, yeah. So to me, it's, 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 it's something, I, I wouldn't say it's really a challenge because uh, it's probably a challenge of a mindset. Yeah, you have to change the people's mindset to say that uh, I'm a humanitarian logistic, I have limited resources, but do you really have limited resources that you won't be able to do your job? I, I, I doubt that, to be honest. So do you think you have a different mindset now? Uh, I have a, I have a both a mindset. 
I have a mindset that I'll be able to take the advantage of being a, a commercial logistician and to, uh, to actually uh, integrate what I have learned and what are my experience with the commercial to put it into a humanitarian logistics. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we've got um, more people raising their hands. So I'm gonna bring each one up to say something and then see how much time we've got at the end to, to have some summarizing uh, thoughts. So um, Radislav, uh, please put your camera on and uh, make your comment. Um, yeah, no, I want to actually, Nicola was before me, so if, if it's okay. That's very kind, Nicola. yes, okay, Nicola. <laughs> Nicola, Jovanovic. I think you need uh, to put your microphone on, yep. I did. Can you yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. So thanks, Raiz, but uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, I think that this is definitely a, a, a time of the meeting when the Balkans are coming to the stage. You're uh, very faint, actually. Can you can you speak loudly or move nearer your computer? Can you better? Is it yeah, better that's now? better. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, <clears throat> very briefly, uh, a couple of points. So the, the first one, it's about a question, would I... Um, prefer to say that I'm a, I'm a logistician or I'm a humanitarian. I mean, uh, when we speak about it, it's how do we define the, uh, a logistician? Is it by educational background or a vocation, you know, like a vocational background, a vocational, uh, being a logistician by vocation? The question here is that uh, I have a lot of colleagues who never had uh, official uh, and the educational background as a logistician, but they dedicated their life to it and they're really good. I mean, they're, they're just better than the many of which is coming to the education background. In the same time, I somehow have a feeling that we have to draw a red line and in a way protect the technical expertise of logistician. Uh, why I'm saying this? So I, I see many operations where I found admin people doing logistics or uh, operational people or program people, and I have nothing against it, that's fine. My question is, have we ever seen a person who is not a dedicated finance person doing finances? I don't think so. And both of those together with an HR, it's a three backbone, like three pillars of support services to the operation. So protecting the, the, the logistician as a technical expertise brings us to the better point of better implementation, or if you want to call it a burn rate, better value for money, more effectiveness, efficiency, cost uh, efficiency, uh, you know, delivery times or whatever. So uh, that's what I would say I'm a logistician. In, I agree with Shokun, it's not really important is it a commercial or, or, or um, a humanitarian one. Uh, second, just a small comment on, on, on Dr. Snaidu's, uh, uh, actually to reinforce what she said, the localization when it comes to logistician training goes two ways. You know, in the beginning of development programs or we call it logistic enhancement, uh, programs, we used to go to the national societies who were our partners on the ground, ask what do you want? And you will know what was the answer. We want trucks, we want vehicles, we want warehouses. And at the beginning, I'm talking like 20 years ago, we did this, we bought this. And then we, we found out that after five years, national society doesn't have resources to keep those. So suddenly, it wasn't really a tools that we gave them that was a direct cost to the national society those vehicles were not registered, rotting on the parking lot. Uh, trucks were not even registered or they didn't have uh, money and resources for the spare parts and stuff. The warehouses were either uh, rented out for uh, some kind of income or were just, you know, they're sitting in the dust as we saw in the Philippines, for example, uh, during the Haiyan um, uh, Earth, uh, Haiyan uh, cyclone, sorry. So, and at the end, the, the last one, uh, because I, I understand the time is limited, when we speak about logistic learning strategy, there, there are two things that we have to pay attention to. And this is to connect a proper training to the proper competence. Being a logistician means refilling the generator and keeping the logbook of the generator. And in the same time, doing a supply chain strategy for the region or, or, or global one. So both of those are logisticians. When we speak about the trainings, there are different kinds of those. And Every organization, if I mean, ideal world, it will be on the, on the global, um, global logistic cluster community that should be a logistic learning strategy that practically describes that 
these trainings is are sorry connected to these certain competencies and this is how you distinguish where are you sitting at are you a responder are you working in development are you trying to uh, you know drive a global strategy and save the world or cut the cost or you know you want to green your response uh, etc etc so there is a lot of points that i listed here but uh, I see that other colleagues are waiting in the line. So that will be that for, for, for my side. For now. Thank okay, you. well, I, I won't let them answer yet because I just want to take uh, the last three points and we have a very short amount of time. So please keep your interventions quite succinct. So uh, uh, Radislav, thank you for waiting, please. please uh, uh, no problem. I mean, I just wanted to say that I agree with Guillaume in the sense that um, I think the humanitarian logisticians can benefit from the commercial logistics. In a sense that, you know, there are concepts in the commercial logistics that um, we referred to and we referred actually yesterday uh, when someone, I think that the, the Kenyan doctor uh, mentioned that the Coca-Cola you can find in any village. And sure enough, you can actually go to El Janina in, in Darfur and you can find the Coca-Cola in, in, a, in a local hut being sold there. Um, but in the same time, we deliver stuff to El Janina. And the difference between the stuff that we deliver to El Janina and Coca-Cola is the fact that people, even the local warlords, want Coca-Cola, where they not necessarily want our stuff there. And so that's where the humanitarian logistics differs from the commercial logistics. They're peddling the product that is actually wanted. We are pushing the product that might not necessarily be wanted. And although I agree with Guillaume, it is really cool to learn about the bottlenecks and the throughputs and, and, and all the stuff that you know you, you do learn in um, your degree or your master's in, in logistics in, in looking at from a commercial sector. Sometimes the commercial sector theory of change or theory, theory of delivery um, gets stopped on a checkpoint. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Diego, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. So just a couple of things. Uh, there's so many things to say in so little time. Uh, on the last comment from Nicola and Radislav, that's completely true, but there's a caveat to that. So in, uh, in the academic sector, supply chain managers are um, educated with, with this idea that's known by everyone like a t-shape type of, of, of skills where they have management skills and specific technical skills that Nicola was uh, referring to. So not, not everyone should be doing logistics. You have general managers and then technical logisticians that know and have that knowledge. And if you see some of the masters around the world have that same type of structure with management, uh, problem solving, and I don't know, risk management, and then technical logistics that uh, as, as uh, Shukun was telling about, there is just the same, it's moving things, uh, customs, transportation, inventory management, it's just the same. The difference is the context where we apply those. And for instance, if you compare construction logistics to retail logistics are two completely different things. So the problem solving is different. And that's the case here. So I think going back to the last uh, co uh, comment, the idea is it would be, sorry, to, to have a more standard way of seeing this and, and try to, as, as Nicola put it, just try to save and, and, and keep the, those technical uh, skills only to logisticians. The last comment, all of these things can be done by something that's known by some academics or most academics, the idea of competence-based education and competence-based training. So just aligning both what is needed on the field uh, at different levels, as Nicola put it, and what can we provide to just link those two. That's it, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Nice and succinct. Um, and finally, I think we Bianca had raised her hand. Uh, Bianca, are you are you there? Hello, everybody. Yes, I am. Yes. Um, I think basically the the comments have been covered by other colleagues. I just wanted to maybe add a little bit, coming back to the national entities that we work with. Remember also that sometimes our counterparts are not logisticians, but they are just carrying out the duties assigned to a logistician. So we, we also have to keep in mind that that's a very important difference with the commercial sector with 
normally the coca colas of the world they have their uh, their local people well trained and able to execute their um, their strategy in the field and get that the, get the, the the products going whereby we sometimes need to to work with what we find in the field and it's not only the checkpoints also uh, we need to quickly bring our counterparts up to speed so we can even be able to communicate with them technically and what we need the, their support in order to to achieve our work so i just wanted to to say that and to keep in mind that there is a reason why you know the humanitarian logistics are more driven by the needs uh, in spite of maybe not making sense commercially that's why we exist and yes i agree we we can find a middle ground to learn from the private sector and bring on whatever technology they have already de um, developed in the benefit of the humanitarian uh, logistics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go back to our panelists, just briefly go around the room um, before we conclude. So Vani is someone who's uh, doing something similar in terms of rolling out training programs, but looking at it from an external point of view, do you have anything to add to this conversation and what can what advice would you give what next step should uh, our uh, logistics cluster and logisticians do you need to put your microphone on just to clarify something uh, nicole's uh, nikolai i think said something about they assess the needs of the um partner etc but sometimes it's not feasible therein lies what's feasible feasible and not feasible to provide for the need now as a good logisticians uh you need to have a policy or a strategy in place to basically extend to exactly how to cater to the actual need etc uh, in terms of, uh, we all are here uh, in terms of, uh, how shall we say, uh, everything is like continuous learning to someone like me. Maybe it's because I'm an educator. But the idea is to better skill, to empower, and to upgrade. We don't know everything. Like many of them said today, they learn from the uh, uh, logisticians, but they're not, the, uh, they're not, uh, uh, you know, in humanitarian. The idea is humanitarian, I agree, is a very specialized field that needs to be promoted on its own. We can borrow ideas to apply it where necessary in terms of where applicable. Therein lies the idea. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And um, let's go to, to Chokun there. Um, it seems that it is such a specialized uh, job being a logistician for a humanitarian organization but is it is it something that you really need to train for or do you really learn lots of it on the job actually doing the work itself uh i'm actually not trained to be a logistician to be honest here but um uh, i joined the logistic field like uh 16 years ago and i i've really been trained on the job and then, of course, that it's not only trained on a job, it's also that I've been giving a lot of opportunities uh, to be trained on logistics and how the logistic, uh, humanitarian logistic work and how the commercial logistic work. So, so it's, it's a both of everything. And of course, that is also the hardware that comes with it and then the software. And then there's also a lot of mentoring as well to where we are today. Yeah. And of course, a lot of new experience. So in terms of actually, um, should we say, building or strengthening or improving the local capacity, what, what do you think the answer is? Is it mentoring or is it an online training course? What, what, is, what do you think is the answer? Take it from me. I'm actually a product of a, a sort of like localization. Uh, because I think after the tsunami that uh, the whole life has been a decentralization uh, from the borders to regional. So this is where we set up the regional office and then we, because we want to be really closer to the field and to the people when we're trying to, to, to respond to an operation. So they start to hire people and locally with uh, also with also with international delegates and, and the same office. So to me, that's the, that's the whole uh, it's a lot of things. It's, it's 
strengthening capacity. It's 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 uh it's mentoring, and then uh you keep on um uh giving people opportunities to to take the decision to make a decision. That's the same with with our local partner as well. Uh, sometimes that I, I know that you know you, you need to know that when to really hold their hands and when to really like you have to let them go and make their own decisions. And the idea is. It's, it's not that we are pushing a lot of things that everything has to be done locally, but the idea is that we want local partners to be able to make a decision and, and being able to also know that where they can actually integrate uh, international uh, support as well. So I, I think that's a lot of things that come into pictures. And I think in today's work, uh, you're right, the cakes have to go to be digitalization. Digitalization is one of the ingredients which is very important with COVID and, and, and we have done say, with, with the trainings fully online for the first time since COVID. And, and, and that, is, that is the trend that we have to look at nowadays. It, 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 it's something that uh, we, we can't get away. And so I, I, I fully agree with, with how these integrations of local capacity building, strengthening capacity building, and digitization is go go and hand in hand. And yeah, and I, I think we see a future in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And some final thoughts from you, Guillaume. Is there anything you want to respond to in terms of what people have just said? Or would you like to perhaps just summarize what you think the next step should be? I'll try to do both uh, shortly. Um, yes, I think the, the, the sharing uh, gave us the confirmation that there is a, a need for circulation between commercial and uh, humanitarian that exists already, but need to be strengthened uh, in, the, in the interest of the humanitarian logis logistics um, community. And then two sides for, for it and for the prof professionalization of the, of, the, of the job. It's like build on the private sector, uh, its accreditation, uh, look, look at it seriously and see what, uh, what's really the accreditation, the programs and so on that we need or, or we can rely on. And also train maybe the recruiters on, on this. Um, and as well as transcends inside the humanitarian sector, the, 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 the mutualization efforts, it's like putting together, how do we work? Do we work the same? So yes, uh, let's try to do a common competency framework. I know there are many initiatives in the sector to do so. Uh, the Réseau Logistique Humanitaire, for example, is doing, is doing so. So uh, agreeing on what we want at different levels, uh, field, um, country level, and, and so on, would help to mutualize, save money, save time, and uh, get uh, logisticians better prepared for the field. And we haven't talked about the new skills that need the logistician in the future, but I think Dr. Bitange told us yesterday about uh, the importance of data, and, uh, um, like cash programming. Uh, there are trends that, that require new skills, and this also needs to be addressed uh, in this regard. So I invite you to, to read the SOHP paper on logistics. It's only two pages, and you would see there like what practitioners, not me, say. Um, I was practitioner, but still. Uh, uh, says about the evolution of the of the profession thank you thank you very much uh, guillaume L lots to think about and lots to, to to change for the future in terms of uh, digitalization and uh, being up to speed on data and blockchain and all the elements we heard about yesterday so um i'd like to um thank the three of you thank you very much for a very interesting discussion and for your different perspectives uh vani naidu thank you very much uh Chok and jang and guillaume uh really good to speak to you and just to say in the chat uh there's a question there, which would uh, be great if you add in to Mentimeter. Were you trained formally in logistics? So um, the, the code is there, 80, 34, 68, 24. Do, do, see, do add to it and we will be able to, oh, there it is. There's the answer coming up now on, on the poll. Uh, that is, that is uh, let's see where it gets us to. Yeah, the majority of people who've answered so far have said um, no, but it'd be interesting to know what training people did have formally in logistics 
and where they were trained and, and what they thought of the course. And of course, you're always learning, continuous learning um, to improve. But it's becoming quite equal there. Um, while that is going on, um, we it is time for the break. Uh, I don't want to eat into it, but I just had a wanted to bring in um, Athlee very briefly because there were two um, questions yesterday after our finance sessions, which um, were not answered. And I just wanted to make sure that um, we can answer them if possible. So um, thank you very much, Vanny. Um, Athlee, are you there? Can I ask, are you there for me to ask the question? Hi, Anya, I am here. I'd yes. just like to thanks a lot to everybody that contributed that panel session. It was really great. Um, so there were two questions yesterday, which we, we didn't answer, and it might be quite difficult to do that. But um, uh, it says on the logistic cluster funding by public uh, and funding by public funding, is there any consideration on providing full trans transparency on the humanitarian effect of all these activities? So I, I think that means, how does one measure the impact? Um, mm. I think that's what it means. Could you just say that again? Yeah, Anya? so uh, is there any consideration on providing full transparency on the humanitarian effect of all the activities when it comes to the public funding of the logistic cluster. Okay, um, I think overall that probably um, brings us back to a question that was raised the other day, which is how do we measure the impact of the logistics cluster operations, whether they be in country or whether it's the global level initiatives. And I think another point that's interesting is of course, as the logistics cluster is um, serving partner organizations as opposed to directly beneficiaries as some of the other clusters do. A lot of that impact measurement is about whether the partners believe that the support that is provided to them um, fully justifies the funds that were invested in the programs, no? Um, and there's a couple of uh, methodologies that we have in measuring that impact. At a country level, of course, we, we, we have the biannual, well, I think that's the right way to say it, twice a year, um, reach out surveys of the partners to make sure that they're happy with what is being provided to them through that cluster operation in country. So while that's not directly connected dollar to output in terms of the public funding that goes into the operation, we do um, very consciously try to follow up um, on the uh, hoped for impacts of the operations for the partners and their programs in country. Uh, and then, sorry, what was the second question? So, so the second question, uh, which might be one that you might just want to reply uh, in a bilateral way or online is basically what does it cost to run the logistics cluster? What is the output and what has changed for the beneficiaries? That's that's quite detailed, so it may not be one for now. I think it's also quite similar, Anya, in the sense that I think fundamentally it sounds as though people would like to know what, what do we get for the dollar that's invested in the logistics cluster operations. And I think um, there's a couple of ways that we can perhaps um, answer that question. One, of course, we try to provide the overview of the financial operations when we have these GLMs. But I think it might be very interesting to hear in more detail from partners, which they can do at any point on the Mentimeter, if there's particular areas of analysis they want to see, particular statistics they want to see, whether it's country operation level or global level, so that perhaps we can adapt the presentations that we provide next time round or bilaterally answer the questions. But it sounds as though those two questions are very much connected. You know, do, is, what is coming out from the money that's going in, whether it be at country level or global level? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Athlee. Uh, and uh, everyone, audience, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for taking part in that last session. We really appreciated your input and, and uh, you know, we want to hear your voice during the sessions. Uh,